the zero edge command for procedures reigns uh, can be really useful. Uh, and if we go ahead and open up uh, the terrain editor for this terrain I have in the scene, you can see that zero edges is turned on. If we turn it off, the edges uh, return to the normal state of the procedural. So the zero edge command uh, basically levels out the edges. Uh, the only problem is there are uh, basically no way to customize that. Uh, so what we're going to do is create a tool to um, create our own zero edges uh, to customize where the clipping is, uh, how intense it is, how high it will go. And um, uh, we can also use the same tool to create procedural erosion. Uh, so some pretty cool stuff. Uh, now this scene uh, is called Rock Noise Terrain A underscore or underscore A underscore zero one. Now this scene was created in view 7.5, or sorry, view 8.5. Um, and since version 8.4, uh, the backwards compatibility has virtually been completely destroyed. Um, 8.4 uh, can open 8.5 scenes, so if you're using version 8 uh, and you have the newest update to 8.4, you will be able to open the scene for using ver version 8.5. Uh, you'll also be able to open it. I'm using build uh, 52.3.11 of uh, 8.5, so it's still a uh, release candidate. Uh, in this backwards compatibility affects everything. Um, so anything created in version 7.4 or 7.5, uh, none of the content, so any trees you create, uh, special species, uh, saving out, uh, any materials, um, any meta nodes, uh, atmospheres, objects, scenes, nothing can be loaded in versions prior to 8.4. Uh, meta nodes, it's unfortunate because uh, you could in view 8 create meta nodes and open them up in view 7, um, provided that the nodes did not use uh, anything unique to view 8, uh, although it would still open the node. Uh, in view 7, uh, it would just not include those uh, new special ones, uh, exclusive view 8. Uh, so Eon did do kind of a number on the program, <laughs> unfortunately, um, uh, but that's okay. Uh, for the most part, the new version seems uh, fairly stable for the most part with a few uh, OpenGL issues. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and open up uh, the terrain editor to modify this terrain. And I'm going to turn off the zero edges. And uh, we're going to take a look at the finish tool to begin with. Uh, first, I do want to talk a little bit uh, just about what's creating uh, the current terrain. Uh, what I have is a grainy fractal um, being combined with uh, two different noise nodes. Uh, these are the sparse cracks noises. Uh, and typically, if we go ahead and just connect to the sparse cracks. Um, the levels above zero uh, become very intense and have these uh, very harsh cutoffs, uh, really depending on the crack width that you use, uh, which is set up uh, within uh, the noise. I have mine uh, connected to the grainy fractal uh, controlling the distribution. Uh, so what I've done is used a smooth clip to cut out um, pretty much everything above one. So if we connect, uh, now there is, although not a completely smooth transition on top, uh, it's not that really harsh line. Uh, most of the transition is smooth. And if we take a look at both of them, uh, so it, you can reduce it a little further. Uh, to get a smoother look, uh, but that's creating those kind of stones uh, throughout the terrain. Uh, and it gives a very interesting mix. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and load in my meta node, uh, which is a filter. Zero edge function. Uh, and I will go ahead and create a view 7 version of this uh, so that it can be opened in 7, 7.5, and um, version eight previous to 8.4. Uh, so you will be able to load this in no matter what version you're using.
Uh, what I'm going to do is just connect this filter. And the first thing we're going to see is uh, the tooth Gaussian noise. So we're going to add in a noise node. Because I selected the sparse cracks earlier, it has duplicated that. Uh, that does sometimes cause problems, because it will create a duplicate ID uh, of that uh, node, and sometimes that causes problems with meta nodes. Uh, so it is usually a good idea to change uh, the noise type immediately, uh, even if you plan on using the same one, and copy over the settings, or use the right-click menu to add in uh, nodes, uh, especially if you're working within a meta node. Uh, but what we're going to do is go over to the math patterns, select the tooth Gaussian, and if we just go ahead and connect this, uh, we'll be able to see the tooth Gaussian. Go ahead and adjust the uh, scale here. Uh, so it's one all the way across. Uh, and what we want to do is use this as a multiplier. Uh, and what we're going to do is multiply uh, this with any existing terrain that you have, uh, making sure it's the last point uh, just before the altitude. And then you can uh, use this to customize that zero edge. So I'm going to go back and connect this uh, to our terrain. And we can see that to start to show up. Now I have a couple of things built in here uh, to adjust for uh, the height. Uh, a force extension and overall height amount in order to be able to really control uh, how much subtraction uh, there is. And we'll be setting up uh, all of these different uh, operations and really learning uh, how they were created, how they work, and how you can manipulate uh, any terrain uh, to customize a zero edge. Uh, so I can go ahead and click Edit and open up uh, the meta node, and we can take a look uh, at its structure. Uh, for the most part, it's a pretty simplistic node. Uh, there's really not much to it. Most of the uh, uh, different uh, nodes you're seeing in Clutter are uh, mainly just on-off switches or uh, just extra little features that may not necessarily be needed. Uh, but they do make it a little more efficient uh, when you're going to be using it frequently. Uh, and since the Zero Edge is really useful, uh, but it is really nice to be able to customize your own, uh, it's nice to have those extra features. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and uh, create uh, our tool. Uh, so we're going to start, before we do anything, we're going to add in an input node position options. This allows us to change the coordinate uh, and the system uh, separate from the rest of the terrain, which is really useful if you have a world uh, terrain. Uh, and I don't want to close this out to show you, so I can just move this panel over uh, so we can see the mapping mode of the altitude production, which is currently set to object parametric. Well, in that case, uh, it's not going to make a big difference of where the tooth Gaussian is going to show. Uh, but if we were using a world mode, uh, what would happen is uh, the origin would change and the tooth Gaussian wouldn't exactly be centered. So what we can do is connect this to our position options input node, change the position type to world parametric or object parametric. Um, I'm going to stick with the object parametric mode. Uh, because the scales uh, seem to work out pretty well. And uh, this way, if we did work in a world mode, it would move with the terrain uh, as opposed to going through it. So everything is always zeroed. Although we can offset it or change the origin of the material, um, which means we could actually extract this and connect it to the terrain's position if we needed to. So we could add an input node, external dependency, set that to the procedural terrain position, and then connect the origin to it. Uh, we're not going to worry about that right now. Uh, we're just going to let the uh, parametric mode take care of uh, the positioning. Uh, so what we want to do is add in, uh, between the link of the offset and the altitude, uh, we're going to add a filter. And we're going to set this filter uh, to uh, offset. And I'm going to set it to zero just for now, because actually uh, there's another thing we really need to set up first. Uh, I'm going to add in our combiner, which is going to be uh, the main controller. Uh, so this is a combiner node set to Blender, 
and we're going to set it to multiply. Multiply by 1 and connect the Gaussian. Uh, now what we're seeing uh, is going to be a little different than what you might expect uh, because our scale uh, is a lot different between a object parametric uh, mode uh, at least with these current settings uh, but you can start to see that subtraction taking place uh, so we do need to uh, make a few modifications uh, basically we need to make sure that the outer edges of the Gaussian are going to be set to a numeric value of zero Anytime you multiply, uh, and what I can do is add in a constant node, set it to number of zero, and instead of connecting it to the Gaussian, connect it to that zero. Uh, and what will happen is the terrain will completely flatten out. Anytime you multiply a terrain by zero, or multiply anything by zero, it's going to return a value of zero. Uh, so that effectively uh, levels everything out. And if we take a look, uh, at the Gaussian, uh, any noise that you work with, uh, any noise node, works between a value of negative 1 to 1. Uh, because it doesn't have things like a fractal node has a uh, like gain or a largest feature. Uh, and uh, those options that are a part of a fractal node it will extend beyond the range of 1 and negative 1. Uh, so a noise will always pretty much stay the same which makes it easier to work with. Uh, but what we need to happen uh, is to take that value that is negative 1 right now and make sure that's 0. So we're going to add another filter between this connection and we can set this to the map uh, which the default settings of lower value at negative 1 and the upper value of 1 which is what the output was from the noise and the output range of 0 which is what we want and we can make the upper value 1. Now we're also going to set up a, an additional feature to be able to control uh, that upper value uh, so we can extend beyond the range. Uh, we can also choose whether or not to clip the out of range values, uh, which shouldn't have too large of an impact. Um, we'll have to see whether or not we should keep that on or off. Uh, in some cases, it might be more beneficial to leave it off. And since the uh, tooth uh, is going to stay between uh, the set values, it might not be an issue, but if we start connecting it to other nodes, then it might be. Uh, so going to the blender, uh, another thing we could do is if we wanted, we could just set a direct multiply. Uh, so if you don't want to have uh, any additional uh, setups in there and you really don't need to have anything else, uh, connected to the ratio or controlling the ratio, uh, you can just use the multiply combiner and it does simplify the node. Uh, but the main thing is right now uh, we don't have uh, a subtraction to create uh, more of a peak type mountain. Uh, what it's doing is leveling it out at zero and then dipping it uh, underneath. Uh, now this is actually pretty close to the original version uh, because it was going beneath the pivot point uh, originally. Uh, but if we want to customize it further, what we need to do is offset the input. So we'll need to extend that a little higher and that way we can get a raised terrain, something that looks a little bit better. Uh, for the most part, right now, it looks about the same um, because there are some additional settings we need to uh, set up. Uh, so if we're going to be offsetting this in order to uh, better or get a better subtraction, uh, then we also need to do the opposite on the way out in order to get our terrain uh, within a better place. Uh, so what we can do is add another filter of an offset uh, which needs to be the exact opposite value of the input or the upper offset. So what we can do is extract this number 
change it over from a constant number to a connectable constant number, and then use the same uh, input to control both of these. So what we also need to do uh, is reverse it. So we're going to add another filter, which is going to be the opposite filter, uh, which will return the negative value of what we have. So if we offset it by 1, the offset on the bottom is going to be negative 1. Uh, so that makes it uh, a little easier to adjust to these settings. And we already have something that's going to work pretty well uh, for customization. So now this constant number is going to be our forced extension. Uh, so in other words, it's kind of a gain uh, for the most part, but it works like the force extension does uh, within the actual terrain editor, um, at least until it is set back to where it was before. Uh, those two tools together work pretty well together. Uh, now one problem uh, is that the scale slider uh, is eventually going to reach a point uh, where it's just too sensitive, and it kind of is right now, uh, where we really have to be in a very high value uh, to use it uh, efficiently. Uh, so what we can do uh, is change the wavelength. Uh, and that's what I have set up in the scale of my uh, current design node, uh, where I can just increase the wavelength in order to create an overall increased amount and then uh, that will allow us to use the slider within different ranges. Now the only two that are really going to matter are the X and the Y because the Z axis is pretty much null uh, within a terrain and we can even just set that to zero. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and keep that at one for now. Uh, there are a lot of techniques you can do uh, and faster renders uh, for terrains you can get by setting all uh, fractals to have a wavelength of zero of, on the Z, uh, but it will decrease OpenGL um, quality, although the render output will look less jagged, uh, and it does change the second output of the terrain and grainy fractal, uh, the d second output detect rough areas, uh, and it will normally require uh, the decimal point to be moved over a couple of notches can also affect the strata filter. Uh, but it does have some interesting things it can do. Uh, so this next part's really up to you, whether or not you'd like to connect the X and Y to be equal as a single value, or to be able to control them independently if you want to shape the zero edge uh, to be oval shaped. So we can uh, create uh, a lot of different types of terrains that way if you want to uh, have that extra control. Uh, then you're not going to want to tie these all together like I'm about to do. Uh, so what I'm going to do is extract uh, our wavelength and uh, change the constant vector that is created over to... Or actually, um, we're going to create a different setup uh, and just end up deleting that, because uh, we're not going to have a constant node uh, just yet. We're going to add in the connectable constant number, uh, which we can't convert this to because it is connected to a vector. Uh, and what I want to do is add in a math node, vector operation, and use the composer 3, which is going to take uh, a number, and you can connect the x, y, and z and in this case, I'm just going to connect all three to the same number. So this way, the wavelength is entirely controlled by one setting. Uh, if you want to have that independent control to be able to create more oval-like shapes, uh, then you will want to uh, create two different numbers, or you can just extract the vector.
uh, by itself and ha just change those wavelength values uh, within the node. Uh, but this has another purpose for creating erosion, um, which can be rather interesting. So I'm going to stick with my uniform value. So if I change that to 2, it's going to change the wavelength on the XYZ to 2 and double the wavelength value. Uh, so that's kind of an overall scale that's pretty nice. Uh, now, another thing we're going to set up uh, is we, whether or not we'd like to use our upper value output of the noise to equal our force extension amount, uh, provided that that force extension is not set to zero. Uh, and if it's set below zero, it's not going to work too well. But if you have a really high range, it can be very helpful. Uh, but we do want the ability to turn it on and off, so we're also going to create an on-off switch. So first we're going to extract this value. We can uh, keep this constant number of 1, add in uh, a combiner node set as a blender, and make an on-off switch. To make an on-off switch, uh, what we're going to have set up is input 0 uh, being the checkbox off, and input 1 being the checkbox ticked. Uh, and the checkbox we're going to create by extracting the ratio and changing the constant number to a Boolean number, which is going to give us an output of negative 1 when not checked and 1 when checked. So by clipping the ratio to 0 to 1, then that lower value gets removed, uh, and it works just like an on-off switch. So when it's on, we're going to set it connected to the force extension, which is input 1. And if you hover over, it'll show you the input. So input 0 to 1, and now we can choose whether or not to use that extension. Right now, it's both set to 1, so not a big difference. Uh, plus, I haven't connected <laughs> the, uh, the map filter to the Blender yet. Uh, so we're going to connect that to the Blender. And now we can check it on and off. If you want to see uh, the difference, we set our force extension to 5. And now, if we choose to use it, check that on or off. Uh, for the most part, it'll look about the same. It really depends on um, the setup. It, it does have its use. Uh, right now, it's not really uh, showing itself very well. Uh, but I am going to change this constant number uh, to 1 uh, as a different constant number being the input box rather than the slider, just because I'm... Uh, there's a possibility that it could be an error. Um, I haven't really run into too many, but you never really know. So uh, this is basically ready to go, uh, and we can start publishing uh, these values uh, in order to finalize the filter. Uh, first, before I do anything, I'm going to go ahead and just save out uh, the scene. I'm just clicking OK to save that as part of the terrain. Uh, save a new version, and then we can go back in and create the meta node. Okay, so what I'm going to do, uh, so back in the function, we'll just grab uh, everything that's going to be part of the meta node and uh, move it over. I'm also going to disconnect the entire function from the terrain at the moment, uh, just so uh, there's no issues with uh, refresh. Um, I've noticed some of the, or most of the stability issues I've run into with Vue have to do with um, OpenGL refreshing. Uh, so when you're making changes, uh, applying different things, uh, that's when I run into the most crashes, which is why I have uh, some settings, uh, the automatic material previewing uh, options turned off in the options. And we'll, go, we'll take a look at that in just a second. Uh, what I'm going to do is, now with all of these selected, create a meta node. And uh, <laughs> as you can see, uh, I did not avoid that issue. Uh, so that's another reason why I saved. Uh, so maybe this time we will not. Uh, so I've got the scene open back up again. Uh, and what I did want to show you is if we go to File Options, uh, Disable Automatic Material Preview Rendering, and only Render Material Previews in Active Editor uh, has prevented a lot of my crashes. Uh, I'm also going to turn off the interactive numeric field changes, which I do normally have turned off, but it looks like my settings were uh, 
uh, reset for some reason. So go ahead and click OK. And one thing I'm going to do is rescale the terrain and make sure that it is above the ground plane, which uh, might have something to do with it. Who knows? <laughs> uh, go ahead and open the terrain editor. Turn off the force extension. And then we can edit the function. And I'm going to leave the uh, output observer and node preview turned off for the moment. And this time I'm just going to go ahead and keep it connected and create a meta node. Uh, and uh, before selecting the meta node directly, I did click off the altitude first. Uh, might help sometimes uh, prevent a crash. Uh, but if you want at this point, you can start to save out the meta node uh, before extracting parameters. Uh, I've already got a couple of versions of this saved out, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and double click and open up the node, and we can start to publish our values. Uh, so the first thing we're going to publish is our force extension amount. I'm going to go to the publish command, and I'm going to create a group called edge control, and then we can just call this force extension. Uh, the next thing uh, we're going to publish is going to be the scale of the noise. So under edge control, uh, we're going to call this the edge scale, or edge radius. Uh, we'll call it edge radius. And then we're going to go over to that constant number uh, that's connected to our wavelength and publish that as the scale. Uh, so that's our multiplier uh, to increase uh, the range of the edge radius. And now if we go over to the Boolean number, which is our on-off switch for the force extension to be used as the upper value of the map, we can publish. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and type in uh, use extension as height. Uh, I'm also going to go ahead to the origin and publish this uh, within a new group. Uh, so this group is going to be for controlling the position. Uh, so we're going to call this uh, edge position. And we could just call that origin. Click OK. And now we have a fully functional node. We can go ahead and save this out. Uh, and I'm going to call this zero edge function underscore B uh, just because I have my own versions and I don't want to mix them up. So I'm just adding a little B to the end of it to let me know that it is uh, separate. Uh, and whenever I make meta nodes, I always like to add a version number in the description. Uh, since the full description never really shows up, uh, except for when you're opening it uh, through the file uh, OS picker, um, you really don't see the full description. So I just like to put in a version number just to know which uh, version I'm working on in case I make changes. Uh, then I can always go back if something breaks or... Uh, depending on different uh, versions of view, it can also be helpful. Let's go ahead and save this out. And now we can open up the Output Observer and start to use the tool. We could choose whether or not to use that force extension uh, as the height. and create our own uh, zero edges uh, and really customize how they're going to show. So now we can see the terrain. Uh, and it's basically the same uh, as it was before, uh, although my uh, scale uh, is slightly outside of the range or the bounds of the terrain.
Uh, we can increase the value further if needed, uh, if you really want to flatten it out. Uh, but for the most part, uh, that's pretty much done. Uh, so now I want to show you how we can use uh, the node uh, to sort of create a recursive type erosion um, because we're able to subtract from the edges. Uh, so we can create some neat effects, uh, somewhat limited, but uh, it really depends on what you want to create. Uh, if you're noticing any flat areas uh, that did show with definition uh, in the uh, altitude production uh, function, then you can turn on force extension and bump it up a little bit higher, which is basically another type of offset. Uh, but what we can do is now use uh, this node and make connections to uh, either the origin uh, or the scale uh, in order to erode away parts of the terrain. Uh, so first let's take a look at extracting the origin and connecting it to a turbulence node. Uh, we can now add a bit of turbulence to the noise. Uh, and kind of erode away the terrain that way. Uh, although this does tend to create too smooth of a terrain, I find, uh, because the noise itself is extremely smooth, has no roughness. Uh, so it's not like connecting it to a fractal. Uh, and since it's being multiplied, uh, it is going to level everything out. So instead, what I like to do, and why I link together all the wavelength values, is extract the scale. And I'm going to turn off the use extension as height for now. And what we can do is connect this to the grainy fractal uh, and to the altitude. And if we need to, we can make some adjustments. I uh, might want to turn that extension back on, maybe increase the radius. Uh, the main thing is, uh, even though that is pretty cool looking right now, um, because the grainy fractal, and if we open up the uh, node preview, uh, that grainy fractal does go outside the bounds uh, and below a value of zero, so it's down negative one, uh, which means we have a wavelength of zero. It's just going to return a value of zero, uh, which means there's going to be nothing showing up for that part of the node. Uh, so if that's what you're looking for, that's okay. Um, if you want this very flat area on the bottom, uh, it is being multiplied down to zero. Uh, but otherwise, what we need to do is add an offset and then make sure that we're offsetting it above zero. Uh, those little spikes that are showing are because it is just uh, a tiny bit below zero in some areas, so it is creating a, a weird look. Uh, so let's go ahead and bring it up to two, and now uh, it's going to work correctly. Uh, so we can use uh, that fractal now to modify the noise and the shape of the noise based on actual features of the terrain, uh, which will give us a, a pretty nice erosion around the edges. Uh, we can go a bit further and uh, add in some filters. Uh, so I'm going to add a filter to the link just above the offset and set this over to the absolute wave. So we can intensify how much subtraction there is and how much erosion is showing. Uh, the only thing you need to be careful with um, when using the absolute wave is you could possibly get some jagged edges on these ridges that are showing. Uh, so that's probably going to be caused by the wavelength. You just need to watch your contrast. Uh, 
uh, and if you need to offset it higher or lower uh, to count and balance that out. So it's a pretty neat looking erosion. And now we can modify the radius and how much it's going to impact the terrain. Uh, so pretty cool. Uh, we do lose the scale multiplier uh, by doing this. Uh, so if you need to, maybe you might want to set up a blender uh, with the noise separately from the wavelength of the noise. Uh, but I find this works out really quite well. And if you want to modify the noise position, you can change the origin and kind of shift it. Uh, so some pretty cool features. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and we can take a look at a render. Uh, now there are a few jagged edges that look like they may show. Uh, if needed, I might just need to uh, modify, uh, maybe with a map node, the uh, output from that absolute wave. Uh, or you can just use a different type of filter. Uh, but let's go ahead and set up a final render and just take a look. Uh, and <laughs> without a texture and with the current lighting, that doesn't look very good. Um, Go ahead and change uh, just the position a little so we can see the terrain a little bit better. Uh, F4 on the keyboard to open uh, the atmosphere editor, uh, modify the azimuth, and change the pitch a little. Uh, I do have a custom shader that I'm using um, for the terrain uh, that I built. Uh, it's still being worked on. Um, not completely final yet, uh, but it uses slope uh, in order to adjust the diffusion, contrast, and ambient light uh, influence uh, on the terrain. And uh, at the moment, it really, really works best for ambient lit areas. Uh, diffused areas can be a bit washed off, so it does need a little bit of work still. Um, because of the compatibility between uh, different uh, versions of you, you may or may not uh, receive this shader uh, with the scenes provided in the training. Uh, but we can see uh, all of that nice erosion rendering uh, and clearly it looks much better uh, within shadows and ambient light uh, because of that shader. As a version uh, 7.5, uh, you do have the ability to extract zones from procedural terrains. Now, with the zero edge mode on, uh, and if we go ahead and add in a zone, uh, the zero edge does show uh, within the zone preview, but once we extract it, uh, that zero edge does no longer apply, or no longer applies. Uh, if we turn it back on, it's going to uh, zero the edges on just the zone itself and it not use the original terrain. So with the tool we've just designed, uh, we can set this up uh, so that no matter what it's going to uh, use those zero edge, or the custom zero edge. Uh, so we're going to go over to the procedural uh, and it looks like something did get messed up here. So um, in this case, if you do lose the erosion tab and you can't, uh, and it looked like for a sec I couldn't turn off the view zones, um, but if that does happen, one thing you can actually do is delete the entire terrain zone, close out the terrain editor, reopen it, and it will refresh. Um, but we're going to go to the procedural, and this is set to a world uh, mapping mode. Now, the node we had set up was set up for the uh, parametric mode. Uh, so we'll need to make a couple of changes. And you can also see that the zone does not refresh. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and move over the terrain, take a look, 
and you're going to see something very interesting, uh, which is the zero edge uh, showing up in the wrong place. And now this isn't my zero edge, this is just the V1, uh, because the entire terrain zone is just messed up, and we also don't have certain commands available. So what we need to do is delete the entire terrain zone, click OK, and then open it back up the terrain editor, and we can get everything back. Uh, so what we're going to do is turn off the zero edge, and edit the function, and add in uh, the new filter. Uh, and I'm just going to use, actually I will load in the one we just designed. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and connect this to our terrain. Uh, set the force extension to 1, uh, maybe a little higher. Uh, it looks like it might be okay. Yeah, it looks like 0.5 actually is uh, going to work out pretty well. Okay, so this is using the object parametric mode, if you remember. Uh, so what we want to do is set up the ability to uh, use a different mapping. Uh, and what we want to do is create another on-off switch. So we're going to add in a blender. Extract the ratio, change that to a Boolean number, go back to the blender, make sure we clip that ratio, uh, and what we want to do is add an input node, and we're going to add a vector 3 input. And this way we can just do this outside of the meta node, uh, create any sort of vector connection. Uh, so now we can publish this value under the edge position uh, as the position vector. Or actually, right click, I'm going to change that to use <laughs> uh, position input, uh, which is going to call upon this position input. Uh, so we will call this position and make sure that is connect, connected to input 1, which it is. So we can click OK. Uh, so now we can choose to use the position input, which is now going to show on the top. And that will work outside the node. So I'm going to go ahead and save my new version. And we're going to connect that position to the position that's connected uh, up at the top. Um, but at the moment, it probably won't move with the terrain because its origin is still set to zero. Uh, so if you're not going to be moving the terrain, that's fine, but it is a world terrain, so we might, we're not necessarily going to be uh, in that area where the noise exists. Uh, it does look like it is applying uh, some sort of subtraction. And if it is moving with it, <laughs> uh, it really shouldn't be. Uh, maybe I did not turn on the use position input. And I did not. <laughs> so I'm going to turn on the use position input uh, so that we can actually see this working correctly. Uh, so we're going to go back and set the position to 0, 0, 0 uh, of the terrain. And we may not really see this because the scale is different. Um, now we're no longer working with the object parametric mode, so the object scale size is going to be a little different. Uh, so we will change the scale of that noise. Uh, and what I also want to do is now extract uh, the origin. Uh, first I'll just show you uh, the node showing uh, I'm going to delete that zone that didn't refresh, click OK, open the terrain editor, create the new zone. Um, but now we move over to the side, we can see that actually showing correctly. So everything outside of that little area is going to be completely flattened. Now this does actually add another way to uh, customize the zero edge directly by being able to just scale the terrain into it. Uh, so if you want to 
modify the zero edge that way uh, by setting it just fixed, you can uh, dynamically kind of scale the terrain into it to fit a little bit better, which is kind of neat. Uh, you could go way beyond that too with uh, different dynamic connections. Uh, but what I want to do right now is uh, take the origin of our noise and add an input node external dependency, procedural terrain position, and uh, the scale is probably going to need to be changed. Uh, because of the way the unit system works. Set it to kilometers. Uh, because noises work differently than uh, fractals. And we may need to really make some modifications here uh, in order to get that to link up correctly. Uh, and uh, it actually looks like at the moment um, linking at the position of the noise just is not working. Um, it's something I'd, I've done before in uh, version 7 uh, without any problems. Um, but it does look like uh, that link within the terrain editor is just not working at all. The uh, external dependency links, uh, nothing is updating or refreshing whatsoever. Uh, it was a bug uh, earlier with uh, version 8. Um, I assumed it was or fixed by now. Um, I guess not. Uh, so what I'm going to suggest uh, that you do if you're going to be uh, have, using a world terrain, uh, and more than likely the position is fixed uh, already. Uh, so what you should do is uh, just use that world input uh, and position uh, the noise manually uh, by changing the origin uh, of the noise to match uh, the position. So you just kind of have to key that in uh, to the origin. Uh, right now I've got it connected to a sphere that's connected to the terrain's position to try to uh, fix that, but it wasn't really uh, working. <laughs> so uh, you just kind of have to manually enter the numbers. Uh, and then once it's in a, a good place, You can click OK and OK again, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, extract our terrain. I'll say delete the entire terrain zone, add a new zone. Uh, the only problem is that the uh, scaling does change. Uh, so it does look like one thing we will have to do is force a different scale. Uh, so what I'm going to do is add the uh, position options input, set it to world standard, and that way it's separate from the mapping mode, and that should allow me to preserve my zone. Uh, the difference is actually uh, showing up right now. Uh, is not because of the tool, but because uh, the view settings <laughs> um, didn't seem to uh, realize that uh, the Z is null and uh, instead will offset. Uh, the position. And there we go. We have uh, an extracted zone on a world terrain with a zero edge and it matches perfectly. Uh, yeah, that's I'm going to show you that in just a second. Uh, anytime you extract any world zone, uh, world mapping mode zone,
uh, what's going to happen is it adds, uh, as you had seen, uh, an offset. Now, typically that would be correct. Uh, the only thing is, uh, the terrain doesn't actually change uh, its shape based on the Z position. It's always set to zero, unless you offset uh, the actual fractal. But the position itself is always zero uh, in the main input. So what it's trying to do is act like a, the original world terrain, which would actually move um, and change its shape as you raised it higher. Uh, there is a way to actually get that functionality back uh, that used to be in the older versions. I'll go ahead and create a new procedural terrain just to show you. Uh, what I'm going to do, edit the object, set it to the world. I'm not going to add any additional nodes turn off zero edges, uh, get rid of the seed, and uh, just modify the largest feature. Um, click OK and uh, just take a look at how the terrain works. As we move it up, there is no change uh, in the geometry. And it's just taking a slice of that zero origin, and then uh, extruding it, uh, creating a height from that. Uh, but if you do want to move it through the actual function, or through the space, the world space, you can add the input node um, of the world standard. And now, as we move the terrain upward, it's going to move through uh, the fractal, which is what the zone extraction is trying to do, is trying to uh, replicate that functionality which was actually removed. Um, it is nice that the Z locks because you don't want to just move a terrain up and then completely change its shape, uh, but that is not built into the extraction as of yet, so you just need to remove um, whatever Z setting uh, is added to the offset or the constant vector uh, that's part of the add combiner node. Uh, and that's really just a problem with uh, world terrains. Uh, it's not really going to be an issue with uh, any object parametric modes. Uh, so I should, theoretically, uh, be able to create a zone now with this proper mapping, extract it, and end up with a matching zone. Uh, so really it's just trying to mimic that functionality that was removed. Uh, so if you are a 7 or 8.5 user, uh, you can use the zero edge and extract your zones with a zero edge and get them to match perfectly.